Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Sunset Hills United Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to have you here worshiping with us on this rainy, rainy January morning. Beloved in Christ, we have announcements for the benefit of the body of Christ this day. Today is the ordination and installation of elders and deacons, and so we rejoice that you are here with us this day for a special day in the life of the church. Deacons, you will have deacon training following worship today from 11.30 until 1.30. It's two hours. Lunch will be provided. And so we will meet in Finley Hall. Join us, deacons, for training. Shelby is on vacation, and so we give thanks for Ryan Gracie and for Harriet Ricker for coordinating our music today. And Shelby will be back in time for our bell and choir rehearsals on Tuesday evening. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, and so we will celebrate the Sacrament of Communion next Sunday, and we will have Fellowship Hour following worship downstairs next Sunday. On February 18th, mark your calendars, Lifeline Screening will be here. You can see Harriet Rickard for more information about Lifeline Screening, and I believe there's information in the bulletin about that as well. Also, Ash Wednesday is coming up that will be on Wednesday, February 22nd. We'll have a pancake supper followed by worship. Are there any announcements that I have missed? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God, centering our hearts and our minds on our Lord Jesus Christ, our worship and praise of him in the lighting of our Christ candle. Holy God, you are the one who has called us, who has named us saints, holy and set apart for your work. Be with us this day. Settle our hearts. Slow us down. Take away any lingering anxiety or our racing brains thinking about lists and things we need to do. God, we pray that your spirit would just dwell in and bring us peace that we may be able to set that aside for a little bit so that we may care for our souls, care for our spirits, resting in you, O oh God, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. For those who care for the weak and vulnerable, Lord Jesus, we praise you. For those whose lives turn toward making a difference, Lord Jesus, we praise you.
Bless us, Christ Jesus, as we confess our brokenness to you and to one another. Hear us as we pray together the prayer of confession as found in our bulletin. You are the heart of mercy, Jesus Christ. You came to this world to suffer, showing compassion on countless individuals in physical, emotional, and mental ailments. We confess we are not so compassionate. We look down on those who do not feel on our time. We grow resentful of those whose griefs surpasses what we have deemed reasonable. We all are
this time, would the children come forward for the children's story time? Hi, kiddo. You think you're the only children? The only child? Okay. Hello. I can mess with your hair because you're my kid. <laughs> So today, we are talking about saints. And do you know what a saint is? Not really. So sometimes we see the name saints on Catholic, Roman Catholic churches. We'll see like St. Bernard's or St. Anne's or St. Winifred's because our brothers and sisters in other Christian traditions, like Roman Catholic tradition, they go through this whole huge process of saying, this person, this person has led such a special, holy life that we are going to call them saint. And we don't really do that. We keep it much simpler. We ask, are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus? Yes. Well, you're a saint. That was a very easy process. <laughs> so you're Saint Fritz. And I'm Saint Mommy. I'm Saint Laura. Okay. And I have this book called Holy Troublemakers and Unconventional Saints. And I thought we'd look at someone who is not a Roman Catholic saint. She hasn't gone through the whole canonization process. But someone once asked her, are you a follower of Jesus? And she said, yes, you betcha. And so she's a saint. And her name is Florence Nightingale. So let's hear this story of an unconventional saint. A small lamp casts light at the end of a long hospital hallway late at night. A woman in a long dress with an apron makes her way carefully down the hall, peeking her head into rooms full of injured soldiers. She checks to make sure each patient is as comfortable as possible. Thank you, nurse, one man says as she helps him reach a glass of water. You're welcome, she says quietly. Now get some rest. Your body needs sleep as much as any medicine. It's the year 1854, and this is a field hospital in what is now Istanbul, Turkey, during the Crimean War. And the woman doing late night rounds is Florence Nightingale, known now the world over as the Lady with the Lamp and the founder of modern nursing. Florence's pioneering work improved sanitary conditions in hospitals and implemented basic guidelines like frequent hand washing. Do you know that they didn't use to wash their hands in hospitals? Is that kind of gross? Well, Florence Nightingale was one of the first people to say, that's kind of gross. And she implemented hand washing and the daily laundering of linens and bandages, saving thousands of lives during the Crimean War. But many people at the time, they didn't know who she was. They didn't know that she was also, instead, in, in addition to being a, a great nurse, she was also a scientist. And she was also a statistician. And she was also a woman of deep faith. Florence lived her life dedicated to serving other people. She had little patience for religious people who worried endlessly about their own private salvation. Instead, Seeing the suffering of people around her made Florence convinced that our job is to work on behalf of others. She wrote to a friend about this undying motivation for her life's work. There will be no heaven for me, nor for anyone else, unless we make it. So we give thanks today for an unconventional saint, Saint Florence Nightingale. So let's pray. You can hold hands for prayer. And I'll just pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the saints, for all the saints of this church, and for St. Taylor, who is going to provide us with children's church today and teach us all about Jesus. 
We give you thanks for St. Florence Nightingale and for all the nurses who work hard to make sure that everyone receives the comfort and care that they need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kiddo, thank you very much. And St. Taylor will take you to Children's Church. And Mr. St. Chip. <coughs> The New Testament reading today is from Acts chapter 9, verses 31 to 34. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it was multiplied. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints that lived at Lydda. There he found a man, a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and indeed every day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Can you finish this prayer? St. Anthony, St. Anthony, turn around. There's something that's lost that must be found. Oh, you are good Presbyterians. A lot of you didn't know it. Well, confession time. I learned this prayer from a former Catholic at my former congregation in Clinton. And in my desperate times, like my really, really desperate times, I mean like really desperate times, friends, I sometimes say that phrase, St. Anthony, St. Anthony, turn around. There's something that's lost that can't be found. And I promise I don't say it in my proud moments. I don't say it in my theologically faithful moments. I only say this in my most desperate of times, in those moments when I'm like looking for my car keys, because I need to get to the airport on time, and I'm going to the airport because I'm going abroad, and you know, I'm leading a group of seven other women, and they're counting on me showing up on time, and my car keys are not where I normally keep them. They're not where I sometimes keep them. They're not where, where I rarely keep them. And normally at this time, my spouse is not at home to support me in this struggle, support looking like me, telling him, what did you do with the car keys? You know, when really he didn't do anything with the car keys. And that's when St. Anthony hears my plea. St. Anthony, St. Anthony, turn around. There's something that's lost that can't be found. <sighs> I'm not proud of it. In Protestant relationships with the saints, it's a tricky thing. Today's scripture is the first scripture in the New Testament that uses the Greek term hagios. Hagios, saints. Saints. Oh, saints. What are we going to do with them? They're tricky for us. We Protestants, those of a Presbyterian persuasion, we pray to Christ alone. Christ alone intercedes on our behalf to the Godhead. We don't need anyone else. We talk directly from us to Jesus to the Godhead. We don't need an intercessor. But that is what the capital S saints in the Roman Catholic, in the Orthodox, and some other traditions, that is what they do. Jesus, in other traditions, he is not someone that one can pray directly to. Um, I remember in my Roman Catholicism class in seminary, there was a Roman Catholic student who said she once had a vision of Jesus standing in her bedroom when she woke up as a child and she screamed, she was terrified, not because she was having a vision, but terrified because it was Jesus and he would judge her. And so that's why she felt she needed the saints or needed Mary, because Jesus, oh my word, he was intimidating. And that was her experience. And I'm sure just like us Presbyterians, everyone who is Roman Catholic or Orthodox has a different experience. The idea, though, is that the saints will intervene on your behalf. There's a saint for everything, as I researched this week. Are you struggling with your taxes? Well, talk to St. Matthew. He's the patron saint of accounting. 
Are you scared of flying? Hmm. Well, take it up with St. Joseph of Cupertino, the patron saint of air passengers. There's a different saint for pilots. Are you suffering from a hernia? Well, St. Cabal is the patron saint of hernia sufferers. Take it up with that saint. There are specific prayers for specific concerns to specific people who specifically intervene on your behalf, like St. Anthony. Now, as Protestants, we don't do this. We pray to Christ alone because our theology says Christ will hear our prayers. Christ will intervene on our behalf. Christ is not intimidating. Instead, as the hymn goes, what a friend we have in him. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. We don't pray to the saints unless we lost our car keys. And yet, let's be real, there's something really beautiful about the saints. There is something beautiful about the saints. If we take a Protestant break from the whole, I don't believe in saints, that's too Catholic for me, Christ alone is my cornerstone, don't talk to me about the saints. If we take a break from all that, well, we can see the beauty of the saints. There's this book called Dinner with the Saints, imagining all of the capital S Catholic saints gathering together for a dinner party. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing to see? And at this dinner party, the book imagines each saint bringing a dish reflective of their time and their place. For example, St. Peter brings tilapia. It's appropriate. And this dinner party, as each saint is described, the dinner party reflects each saint's personalities, each saint's miracles, each saint's failings. Failings. This book, it provides us an image of the saints as they were. Saints, as our fellow Christians, as our brothers, our sisters in following Jesus. The saints, as people that we can look up to, as people we can learn from as people we can admire. In my word, we don't need to pray to them. We don't need to put up icons of them. We don't need to wear medallions of them. But we do need to see that these are fellow followers of Christ whom we can learn from and see the beauty in. The beauty in saints like Saint Kateri Tekakwitha, a Roman Catholic saint who comes to us from the Mohawk tribe somewhere around the modern-day city of Montreal. Now, she was the first person of Native American descent to be uh, canonized, to be made a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. And Kateri, she is remembered as a soft-spoken woman from the 17th century. She'd been orphaned at the age of four during the smallpox, smallpox epidemic, which killed 5,000 of the 8,000 people making up her Mohawk tribe. Kateri came into adulthood amongst her family, and she knew of Jesus because there were Jesuit missionaries who frequently visited her community. And the leaders of her community would typically say, we have a faith already. Get out of here. Do you want to trade? Do you want to talk? Great. Don't talk to us about Jesus. Go. Like everyone else, Kateri knew about Jesus. She knew about the Jesuits, but she wasn't converting until one day she broke her foot. 18 years old, Kateri breaks her foot. And all the other women go leave to do their daily work. And Kateri is stuck at home with her foot elevated. What's she going to do? The Jesuit missionaries, they stop by. and She's got all the time in the world. I mean, it's not like she's watching The Price is Right. You know, it's the 1680s. 18-year-old Kateri says to the missionaries, all right. I'm not doing anything else. Let's talk about your Jesus. So they talk. And Jacques de Lamberville baptizes Kateri the following Easter. She goes on to live at their mission until her death at the age of 24. Kateri's last words were, Jesus, I love you. Saint Kateri Tekakwitha is the patron saint of environmentalism. A saint who has much to teach us, not because she went through a canonization process, but because she's our sister in Christ. 
Kateri is our sister in the faith, a fellow Christian, a mother in our faith who has gone before, as are most of the saints. Note this is lowercase s saints. We do not affirm the capital S saints. We do not affirm the canonization process. Fritz just went through our canonization process. You saw how quickly that went by. We do not believe followers of Jesus can reach a point of holiness where they are worthy of some special title set apart from all other followers of Jesus. But we do, as Presbyterians, believe in lowercase s saints. We believe everyone who is a follower of Jesus is a saint. This includes St. Kateri Tekakwitha. This includes St. Catherine of Siena. This includes St. Francis of Assisi. This includes St. Lucy Filippini. She's really cool. I can tell you about her later. This includes St. Anthony. This includes St. Sebastian. The list goes on. Nothing separates us from our connection to these saints in Christ. Don't feel bad learning about them. They're cool. You're allowed to love them. You're allowed to enjoy them. But learn, love, and enjoy the saints knowing that Lois McMahon is a saint too. Lois McMahon, she's a saint who loved this church, was a member of this church for decades, loving this church, serving as the chair of the facilities committee. Eilina Weirman is a saint, a saint who was a member of this church for decades, who joined this church after living her childhood as a pastor's kid on the south side in the 1930s. Amazing saint. Dick Moore is a saint. A saint who showed his love for Jesus with a paintbrush on this church's walls. Countless men and women whom you remember from this church, from the church you grew up at, if it's not this church, from the church you call home, if it's not this church, from the church that it may be across the neighborhood, from churches in countless neighborhoods, from churches in every state, from churches around the world, they're made up of saints. Saints. Your deceased siblings in Christ are as much a saint as any of the fully human folks the Roman Catholic Church calls saint. And more exciting still, the person sitting to your left is a saint. You can look at them, yeah. And the person sitting to your right, take a look. That person's a saint also. <laughs> You're all looking at saints. Look around this room. And when Luke writes the saints in the book of Acts this day, he means those people you're looking at. And he means you. You are as much a saint as St. Patrick. Just you wait, friends. We're going to dye the mon green in your honor. You're a saint. The good news of the gospel this day is that every one of us is a saint. And everyone who has gone before in Christ is a saint. Changing the way we treat others and the way we treat ourselves. When we see others, when we see ourselves as saints, we are changed in the way we live, in the way we treat each other. Imagine this week that you're sitting at the doctor's office. And imagine that the doctor's office is running behind. And imagine that they finally get you into an exam room and you think, this is it, the doctor will be here any minute. And you're waiting another hour, sitting in the exam room without even the young and restless on the TV to watch in the waiting room. And as you wait, the doctor finally comes in. And you know the doctor is a churchgoer. You know this from previous conversations. But this time around, imagine that the doctor is rushing. Your nerves are done. You want to snap. But you've practiced looking at every person as a saint, set apart, beloved, holy in God's sight. And so you don't snap. You see a doctor that is not giving you subpar care right now. You see a doctor who is a saint who is having a really crappy day. You still advocate for yourself. You still call the doctor to attention. You still seek the care that you need. But your attitude, your inner disposition, your blood pressure couldn't be more different. Because your doctor isn't just a doctor. Your doctor is a saint. And what about yourself? 
Oh, you know, all of us, we had those New Year's resolutions. We weren't going to snap anymore. We weren't going to snack after dinner anymore. We weren't going to miss church on Sunday. And then what did we do? We snapped. We ate the whole bag of Tostitos. And we had nacho cheese with them. And we missed church. Not one Sunday, but two Sundays in a row. Cue the guilt. Oh, why can't I get it together? Or cue the deep breath. Remembering you're a saint. You are beloved in God's sight. Holy. You had a bad moment. Jesus forgives. And you try again. It changes us saints. It changes us to see each other as saints. It changes us to see ourselves as saints. Sainthood creates space for grace. Sainthood creates space for patience. Sainthood creates space for believing the best about other people, giving each other some wiggle room even as we give ourselves some wiggle room. Sainthood is a gift from God in Jesus Christ because God in Christ, he loves us no matter what. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, elders, I'm going to invite you to stand on the side of the Clavinova. And so Jody Colby, Ryan Gracie, Tim Faco, you are invited forward for both installation and ordination. And deacons, I would invite you to stand in front of the pulpit. And so I would invite forward Mike Duffner, Debbie Edwards, <coughs> Leslie May, and Amy Riley and Pat Patterson. Pat Ellis is unable to be with us this day. Um, she is recovering still at home. Friends, you can follow along in your bulletin here. If you want to stand here and face the congregation, because they're going to be voting on you, so they want to see your faces. So you can follow along in your bulletin here. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians that as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is one body and one spirit, just as we were called to the one hope of our calling. In baptism, Jody, Ryan, Tim, Kara, Mike, Debbie, Pat, Leslie, and Amy were clothed with Christ and are now called by God through the voice of the church to enter into ministries of service and governance, announcing in word and deed the good news of Jesus Christ. We remember with joy our common calling to serve Christ, and we celebrate God's particular call to our brothers and sisters. There are varieties of gifts, Paul tells us, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. We be given the gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Hear this statement on ordination and installation. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. And so now we will all together reaffirm the baptismal covenant, and so I in invite you to stand if comfortably able. We do this because ordination calls the whole church to be renewed in our commitment 
and reminds us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. And so we reaffirm our baptismal vows this day, renouncing all that opposes God and God's role, and affirming the faith of the Holy Catholic, meaning universal, church. And so I will ask you all questions, and I will give you all the answer. Beloved in Christ, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, answer, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, answer, I do. I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Friends, if you return back to your bulletin here, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks. In countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you that in baptism you give us your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all the nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you have claimed us in our baptism and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us, that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor now and forever. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. I will now present the constitutional questions to those being installed and or ordained. And so, friends, this is for three of you, and for the five of you, I can see you. Great. All right. <laughs> I trust you all. Okay. <clears throat> Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, answer, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, answer, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what the scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, answer, I do and I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, answer, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, answer, I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, answer, I will. I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity and purity of the church? If so, answer, I do. <coughs> Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, answer, I will. I For the deacons, hello friends. Hi, Pat. you're back there, hi. <laughs> Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, 
urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will. For the elders, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will. To the congregation of Sunset Hills United Presbyterian Church, do you, the members of the church, accept these individuals chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, we do. We do. do you agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ who alone is head of the church? If so, answer, we do. we do. Friends, at this time, I would invite the elders and deacons, you can kind of like come together here, you don't need such a big gap. Come together here, and I would invite forward all those who are ordained elders or deacons, come forward, we're going to bring back the laying on of hands, if you feel comfortable doing so. And so, if you have ever been ordained, as an elder or a deacon in the Presbyterian Church, we're invited to come over and put a hand on one of the elders or deacons, and we will pray. It's up to you what way you want to stand. This is per your discretion. Gracious God, throughout the ages, you have been faithful to your covenant people, whom you have called out of bondage and redeemed to be your own. In every time and place, you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation. We are grateful for the ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. We praise you for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth. We thank you for women and men in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your servants, whom you called through baptism as your own and marked as your own. Grant them the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give them a spirit of truthfulness that they may show the compassion of Christ in the acts of daily living and rightly govern your people. Give them the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and wisdom. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, give to your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor, and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain this congregation in ministry. Ground us in the gospel. Secure our hope in Christ. Strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, if you are not being ordained or installed today, you may be seated. Ryan, you gotta stay. Beloved in Christ, you are 
now installed and or ordained as elders and deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Friends, your charge this day comes from Jesus' words according to the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, for they were harassed and like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Amen. Let us welcome our newest officers with applause. Six 
extend our sincere sympathy to Lori Madsen, whose mother passed away on January 5th. Friends, God is good. God hears our prayers. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Lord, you are the God who hears. You are the God who hears our words. You are the God who hears our thoughts. You are the God who hears our hearts. God, we thank you that you hear us. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah, our way, our truth, our life. God, you are good, and we see the fullness of your goodness in Jesus Christ, who is with us by the power of your most Holy Spirit. Lord, we lift up our prayers of rejoicing and thanksgiving. God, it is a blessing to be in this place to be with our church family, to support and encourage one another in this Christian way. And God, we give you thanks for our friendships. We give you thanks for our workplaces and for the places we go throughout the week and the time that we get to be with people that we are fond of. Holy Lord, we give you thanks for our families. And we lift up to you silently now our personal, private prayers of thanksgiving. To you be the honor and the glory and the praise, dear Lord. We lift up in prayer this day those whom we love. We pray for Lori Matson's family and for Lori, that you would wrap your loving arms around them in this time of grief. God, we pray that you would comfort them with the hope of the promise of the resurrection and that this church would come around her and support her. God, we pray for those who are suffering from illness of body, illness of mind, illness of spirit. We pray particularly for Pat Ellis as she continues to recover. We pray for Roberta as she continues her journey. And we pray for Dee Borman as she recovers and settles into her new home. Lord, we lift up to you silently now our private prayers of concern. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear us this day as we pray for the Adamses as they continue their mission service at the U.S.-Mexico border. Bless them, we pray, dear Lord, and those whom they serve. We pray for our World Vision sponsored child, Pabazzo. We pray for our sister church in Lichenza, Malawi, praying your blessing upon them. Lord, we lift up before you all of those men and women serving our nation in harm's way, locally and abroad, praying that you would bring them home. We pray for their families as they wait for them, and especially this week, dear Lord, as our hearts are breaking, we pray for the people whom they are called to serve. God, we pray for peace in this nation. Our hearts are broken, just as so much in our nation is broken. We need you, dear Lord. God, we pray for all of our leaders, the leaders of this congregation, the leaders of this community, the leaders of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the leaders of this nation, and leaders around the world. We pray that they would humble themselves before you, dear God. We pray for peace on earth that comes through Jesus Christ. Go with us, we pray, into this new week, into this new month, we pray that you would guide our thoughts, guide our words, guide our deeds, that in thought, word, and deed we may glorify Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our tithes and our offerings will be collected this day by Beth Romang, our financial administrator. And so she will be at the back of the sanctuary following worship. And um, friends, it is a blessing to be able to give, to be able to continue to bless the ministries of this congregation for the sake of God's kingdom. Let us say a prayer of dedication over our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Lord, receive these, the gifts of our tithes and our offerings. May they be used for the sake of your kingdom and for the sake of your glory. Amen. Let us stand as comfortably able for the doxology.
Beloved saints, receive this blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.